I wanted to uh, share with you something just funny. Uh, this is a fellow uh, in Dublin who I uh, came across on Twitter, and he uh, does adaptations like the uh, um, Blunt song, um, You're Beautiful. And um, he changed it to sing, You're Too Close. <laughs> and um, he sings it with passion. And so I wanted to suggest if you want to have some fun with it, uh, check him out on uh, Twitter and uh, uh, hear some of his songs. Um, let's see. I've, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, scientific aspects of this uh, principally, and um, I have a friend, he's a physicist that I've known for many decades, um, uh, and um, he uh, and I've been, we always communicate about scientific things, and uh, he actually did some uh, analysis of uh, the mess we're in. Uh, and um, I just wanted to show these quickly. One reason I'm bringing him up is because he has told me when I speak, I tend to try to cram a semester into an hour. So I'm going to try not to do that today. I only have a 25 slides. Here's another of um, his um, uh, analyses and curve fitting. Um, and he used a Cormac McKendrick uh, model, which is used in epidemiology. And world of meters info is a good source for how bad things are at the moment. We are over a million now of known infected cases. And um, uh, the um, uh, slide is self-explanatory. There's one other thing I want to put out here, and it's on my profile as well, that I made a PDF. Um, and it's on my Google Drive of the slides I'm going to show. Um, trying to get back here, and I'll paste it in. And anyone that like to look at my slides in more detail, are, they're welcome to. Um, the uh, slides often will have more information than um, uh, one could uh, hope to um, cover in uh, proper amount of time like we have. But uh, you can go if you're interested and uh, examine the points I make. I try to make the slides as much standalone as possible. Once again, I like to emphasize, I think this is a really um, important um, way of thinking of slides, um, of, of viruses. Uh, that is, uh, the David Baltimore classification from 1971 is a remarkable individual. And it was just at the right time when people had uh, been bre broken the basically the genetic code and uh, figuring out how molecular biology drives life. And um, it made only, only made sense to switch over from um, trying to organize phylogy of uh, uh, viruses, which are things, uh, but they still uh, part of biology, so they try to associate them by morphology and their um, antigenicity and um, their behavior. And yes, uh, DS stands for double strand, SS for single strand. Uh, the type of virus we're talking about here with uh, the SARS-CoV-19, uh, um, it's actually CoV-2, uh, I'm, I'm really screwy with semantics at times. Uh, Phil pointed out in our last talk that uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 is the current accepted name for this virus, and uh, COVID-19 is the um, term for the disease. And I, um, I really hadn't um, paid attention to that, but I think that's valid. Um, and so uh, at any rate, uh, I have it mistyped in there, and I apologize for that. Um, it's because my brain works. But uh, uh, this is a type 4 virus. It has a long, single strand 
in positive sense of sing, a single strand of RNA. Uh, it goes uh, just under 30,000 um, bases. And um, in positive sense means that just like messenger RNA, it's read from the five prime end to the three. As soon as it gets into the cell, it can be read by the ribosomes and, and uh, have some translation going on. It, um, uh, I, I want to point out also that uh, type 5 are RNA viruses, but their negative sense or antisense type um, arrangements. And uh, both of these kinds of viruses require RNA polymerase. And that plays into some of the potential treatments for this. So keep that in mind. Um, uh, one of the um, well-known um, type 5 viruses is the Ebola virus or Ebola-like viruses, which come from fruit bats. So quit eating bats. Quit eating bushmeat roadkill. And um, so... Uh, at any rate, uh, let me go on to the next slide here. I love bats, actually. I think they are very cool, and I never hurt them. If I come across one, I uh, protect it or I'll rescue it and put it someplace where it's up high enough that it can fly down. It needs at least a five feet clearance on a drop to be able to um, get... Uh, into flight. Uh, so uh, I think that bats are likely to be maligned and they eat all these nasty little bugs that uh, may be more trouble to you if um, they uh, bite you, especially with the uh, climate change and malaria pr uh, progresses northward. Um, I don't eat anything that's a vertebrate, uh, really. <laughs> I think. Uh, they're a little too closely uh, related uh, genetically. Now, uh, in this terms of structure, the coronavirus, um, uh, a helical, meaning it's like alpha-shaped, it, it wraps a helix uh, of RNA. It's a long single strand. The, op the uh, alternatives are having circular strands or having fragmented strands. And there are viruses which have fragmented strands. Um, now, it seems to me it would be much more difficult for a virus to be successful with a fragmented strand having a single package. Um, that's like mailing your taxes in one page at a time. Uh, it's a good chance you'll have one not get there or not get in the right place. It just seems to me it's uh, amazing that um, fragmented viruses could make it. But um, I'm going to talk about uh, mutation rates with these viruses. These are the largest of the RNA viruses, these coronaviruses. They're larger than they're supposed to be, in a sense. Uh, they have, uh, you know, well, let, 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 me, let me get back to this, because uh, I want to have a, a little bit of discussion to make before I, I start talking about how the genome re uh, replicates itself, but um, there's a bi lipid bilayer, which is like an envelope uh, that's around this. The nucleocapsid um, is the RNA um, helix, and uh, it's covered with or encased in these N proteins. N proteins. Um, there are three other kinds of um, uh, proteins of interest in uh, our particular virus. We want to talk about the spike protein that everybody's been hearing about in the news. Um, stand to watch the news. I've actually gotten to where I'm watching 30 Rock, some with Tina Fey and Alex Baldwin uh, just to escape. Um, the membrane um, uh, protein or M protein uh, and the E protein or envelope proteins, uh, the spike membrane and E proteins are all really in the um, envelope um, uh, and uh, extend through the envelope really uh, in, in most cases. 
Uh, so um, let's see. Let's go to the next slide. This is a com created co a Creative Commons slide I came across that's pretty good. Although it has, uh, I would um, not pay much attention to the uh, hemagglutinin and uh, esterase dimer part, uh, but it shows this uh, helical spiral inside this uh, spherical capsule, uh, and it has. Uh, N proteins on it, and there's what's called this matrix, which is this little space between that and the envelope, and um, uh, which is um, worth talking about a little bit because all this has to get opened up and the genome has to be made available to the ribosomes in the victim cell or host cell. Um, in the um, uh, the, the envelope there, which you see is, is kind of marked as a, a red uh, uh, stolen structure uh, from uh, probably the Golgi process, um, maybe some from the cell membrane, uh, uh, has um, the M proteins in it, uh, which are uh, probably the most important protein in having this thing work. Um, to be able to replicate itself inside the cell. And uh, the um, um, uh, E proteins or envelope of proteins, as I guess you, the bottom of this list on the right there, you see that. And uh, then the spike protein, which is again, real important, the S protein, which is really quite interesting. It's, um, it's three monomers. It's a trimeric uh, and each monomer of the spike protein has um, uh, two subunits and that's important in terms of how the attack on the cell takes place. Um, uh, I came across all kinds of beautiful uh, cryo electron microscopy uh, uh, images of these uh, spike proteins in particular and uh, um, well pretty much every aspect of these uh, infections you can imagine those require a lot of work and uh, um, I think they're uh, something you might want to look at uh, on your own uh, I was thinking I got I started to go crazy because there's so much I'd like to have included but it's too much um, uh, well, the, the mitochondria have circular DNA in them uh, and uh, uh, RNA polymerase uh, uh, as well. But uh, um, at any rate, those are all various organelles uh, or small uh, functional units in the cell. This is a slide I'm not going to say a lot about except uh, this uh, 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 glycoprotein M uh, drives the assembly of the coronavirus when it has to get put together, uh, which then end up budding uh, into the lumen of the uh, ERGIC. There's this, uh, these little organelles which are viral induced uh, um, tubulo vesicle uh, structures. Um, that's the endoplasmatic, uh, endoplasmic reticulum Golgi intermediary, intermediary compartment. Um, and M is the most abundant of these uh, envelope proteins. E is the least abundant, but it's really critical for having a uh, uh, good output of the virus. Um, the S is uh, uh, kind of the last thing that goes on there, and it uh, is um, it it uh, yields a, um, a virus that is armed and dangerous. And uh, so let's see. I, again, this slide would be one that you might want to look at again in uh, uh, PDF. And this one too. I don't want to go into this too much, except that if you take the e gene. 
uh, from the coronavirus uh, genome, you won't get much production of virus growth and particle formation. There are studies that involve uh, creation of viral-like particles, VLPs, just like back when I talked about um, um, HPV or human papillomavirus and the vaccines being viral-like particles that were created um, um, in nucleosynthesis, really, uh, uh, from the uh, uh, genome, but are free of any genetic uh, material, but they self-assemble. Uh, one of the points I'd make in this kind of thing, having a self-assembled um, uh, viral particle uh, without the S spike, I really question how effective that would be for a vaccine because it's enveloped. It's sort of like you get a letter bomb, uh, thinking back on Unabomber, you know, you open up the envelope, that's when you get the surprise. You know, the envelope really conceals the dangers of this thing. Um, okay, let's see, let me go on here. So, first off, I, I would like to point out there's this innate immunity, and I, I, it's another one of those aspects that's too much to talk about here, but I have some slides in a bit about um, um, a, uh, the ACE2 or angiotensin, it should be angiotensin converting enzyme uh, uh, 2 is what most people would call it. Um, angiotensinogen is the precursor, but ACE2 receptors, it has a peptidase uh, activation uh, site on that, uh, it, it's a domain on that receptor that works to activate angiotensin. And one reason why, you wonder why would they have that in the cell? A, who is they? But why would that be in the cell? Most of these things have functional structure, function, sense that you can draw from it. The lung is in the borderline, it's sort of a vascular organ. It's in a sense, it's part of the vascular system. It's every drop of blood in your body goes through your lungs from the right side of the heart uh, to um, get uh, gas exchange. Uh, carbon dioxide uh, gets to come out along with the garlic you ate and um, uh, you get to absorb oxygen into your heme uh, in the red blood cells. And uh, so it makes sense really uh, physiologically that you would have um, uh, receptors that would have uh, actions that would cause vasoconstriction, for instance, as angiotensin does. Um, uh, so that's why you have them in the lung. You got them in your endo in, uh, endothelium of your blood vessels and your kidneys and all over. Uh, so attachment is the first step. Then the uh, virus has to get taken in, uh, generally thought by endocytosis, but I, I don't think that is necessarily 100% in terms of, I think there are times when the whole thing may just roll in. but. Um, uh, this thing has to get uncoded. Most of the, res uh, of the research papers you read about this, they gloss over uncoding. They'll say, uh, after uncoding, and that's the only time you'll hear that mentioned, uh, uncoding is actually a more complicated process than that. And it's really important. If you can't do coding of the virus, uh, or if it doesn't get uncoded, then uh, the RNA is not going to be um, exposed to your um, uh, um, translational machinery, the ribosomes, and uh, the virus won't succeed. Um, and then there's biosynthesis, which I'm going to talk about. It's a beautiful strategy, in a sense, that uh, this uh, thing can be interpreted as. I don't think it was created uh, by intelligent design or anything, but I think that one can in, uh, perceive uh, uh, 
why it works the way it does uh, and make sense of it. Um, finally, maturation, uh, when the viruses get uh, viral particles, virions get uh, assembled and then egression uh, by uh, uh, um, the cell, which leads to further infection of other cells. Okay, I don't want to deal with this a lot. I, I did want to show you some cryo electron micrographs of the ACE2 cells. There are uh, uh, two types of um, epithelial cells in the alveoli. Um, there's a type 1, uh, which are kind of like cobblestones. There's squamous in their shape. And uh, you may have, might have heard of squamous cell carcinoma. That just means squamous is just a morphologic description. But those um, are living cells that are spread out thin, and they are important especially to diffusion. Um, they're just a barrier between the lumen, where the air is, and the uh, interstitial fluids and the capillaries that are um, uh, branching off the pulmonary artery. Pulmonary artery is, um, from the right side of the heart, is deoxygenated blood. And the pulmonary vein draining to the left side of the heart is oxygenated, it's oxygen rich, kind of a little twist on what you usually think about um, peripheral circulation. Uh, but at any rate, uh, this has an interesting aspect, it has a pore here that they happen to catch uh, where there's a little arrow on that upper left. And I think it's marked here on these other uh, slides. In these um, cryo EM or cryo electron microscopy uh, images, they do thousands of beams on different angles and they get a lot of data and they can crunch the data and create Algorithm, algorithmically create the images, and they can make them any color they want, anything, um, if there's a uh, mathematical difference in the data. So a lot of the people involved in this have information technology computer backgrounds. Uh, they're not biologists uh, at the start of it. Um, OK. The spike protein, it's a trimer. It has, uh, each trimer has two subunits. One interesting point, there's only 76% similarity between the amino acids of the S protein in our current um, um, severe uh, acute respiratory um, uh, uh, syndrome, CoV-2 and the original SARS epidemic back in 2002 and 2003. It's really remarkable to me that you can have that much difference in the amino acids and still have um, uh, same target receptor. Now the exact binding domain, receptor binding domain on the target is uh, uh, different uh, significantly from the original SARS as well, but it's still the same overall molecule. Um, anyway, when this, uh, and, and HACE2, you might see that abbreviation, H it just means for human, um, as it can be from all kinds of uh, origins. Um, when this spike protein hits, it has to be split. This thing's a switchblade. You can think of the S as uh, S for switchblade. Uh, that has energy stored in it. And when it has a, there's a kinase, uh, uh, a protonase uh, action that takes place. I'm going to tell you about in a second. When it and gets attracted, it basically uh, draws into the target uh, receptor. Uh, by van der Waals forces, uh, this um, action of protease action or, which makes the um, uh, 
uh, S1 and S2 split apart. Um, 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 causes a uh, change. Let's see if I got something about that. Uh, uh, in the S1 domains, so the S2 is over. It's kind of splits, and it's still attached there. And the S1 then has is free to have its blade come out, in a sense, like a switchblade. It ha and it it's, you know, when you have messenger RNA. Uh, getting translation of uh, um, into uh, peptides. You can have chaperone molecules that will bleed around the peptide to keep it from folding up uh, prematurely. Because if it, that's tertiary structure, the, the shape of an, uh, a protein. Uh, and that's what gives it its action, its enzymatic action. And um, if it folds up too early, it'll get into a knot basically. Think of it that way. So these chaperone molecules will gather around it and it uh, terminates translation and uh, uh, finishes making the peptide, the primary structure of the protein, and the chaperone molecules, there's several of them maybe, wherever it needs to be, uh, goes to a barrel-shaped, it's often described, structure called chaperonin, which is a machine. It's a molecular machine. And it goes, this whole assembly goes into there, the peptide goes into that, and there's um, some uh, phosphorylation um, involved and energy action um, to shape the protein, and then it's ejected in its, or in its tertiary form. So I don't know if you knew about that, but that's pretty cool. Uh, in a sense, this um, S2 subunit is a chaperone for S1. Uh, nobody actually that I read uh, described it like that, but it's the same sort of thing. It protects it and keeps it in a kind of a native form until it's ready for action. And uh, so I won't go on about the rest of this. I, I, I always hated to uh, have in a situation where you just read slides. Uh, so at any rate, you get cleavage of the um, spike, and um, the um, S1 adheres to the um, um, ACE2 receptor, which is shown here from cryo-electron microscopy derivations. And at the top of this, uh, in orangish, is our uh, coronavirus uh, uh, spike protein attached. And um, the uh, bio EM is so cool, it can show changes in conformation. There's kind of a generally an open and a closed conformation for the ACE2 um, receptor. So it, it changes uh, its configuration and um, uh, the um, receptor, it's thought, gets taken into the cell by endocytosis is probably the easiest way to describe it. Here's another picture. I didn't want to deal a lot with this, but you see it has a neck. And these linkers, are, and uh, TM means the transmembrane part, and the um, other parts up out uh, on the outside of the cell membrane where it can receptive to um, molecules. Um, and this shows different configurations. It's really just extraordinary. And I was, would have loved to have seen this when I was a kid. Uh, wasn't possible. But <laughs> if you're really young, you don't know how good you got it. All the things you can see these days. OK. This is uh, also another thing I, I wanted to give information for people that want to dig a little further. But um, uh, generally, the transmembrane serine protease 2, um, it, it, this, it, the top of the slide talks about the coding gene for that. Uh, and diseases with that enzyme are uh, associated with 
influenza, it activates and uh, promotes the um, uh, uh, intake of uh, influenza viruses at times, but also it's related to uh, prostate cancer and processes in prostate, prostate cancer. But at any rate, this enzyme is in the host membrane and near the ACE um, receptor. And it punches the uh, uh, um, spike protein and uh, is involved in uh, uh, leaving the dimer uh, of the spike protein monomers. There's three monomers and each are a dimer uh, or uh, have two subunits. And so the, it, it uh, cleaves each of those into two subunits so that the active one, the S1, can uh, bond in tight uh, and intimately with the um, um, molecules of the ACE2 inhibitor and uh, or the ACE2 receptor and um, uh, then uh, it's felt that the uh, S2 promotes the cell membrane starting to get sucked in and alter its shape and uh, take in the virus. I think there's a lot to be learned about how this really takes place. It's still a vague um, explanation for how the virus gets in. So um, this is just some more about this serine protease um, uh, enzyme that's a host enzyme. And it's a transmembrane enzyme in uh, um, uh, human cells that's involved in the proteolytic uh, cleavage of the spike glycoprotein. So I'll let you look at that in the uh, PDF if you're interested. And I guess I wanted to emphasize the um, uh, ability of the SARS-CoV uh, virus to get out. And this is undoubtedly true as well for the SARS-CoV-2. Uh, depends on M membrane uh, protein, the E envelope protein, and protein. Um, all three of those have to work together. And um, this makes reference to the one study about creating viral-like particles to study how this thing assembles. Uh, in a bit, I have a diagram that may, hey, here we are. OK. This is going to be um, interesting, I think. The, I didn't, um, there, were, there were a lot of diagrams uh, that I could have chosen. I, I figured this was as good as any. But uh, what I didn't um, show in this, or it doesn't show in this, is uh, after the attachment and entry, uh, this tends to be in a vesicle is the way it's described. And then the vesicle um, uh, merges with the lysosome, which has proteolytic enzymes and uh, degrades molecules. It's a way the cell protects itself. And um, uh, it's acidic. And that uh, environment uh, promotes the uncoating and also the uh, removal of the N protein from the RNA. So you get an uncoated air positive strand, single 29K plus, you know, between 29K, 30,000 bases of RNA uh, that uh, are there to party. And um, there's one other thing I'll, I'll say about this. The, um, the ACE2, uh, uh, the, the um, um, type 1 epithelial cells I said were uh, like cobblestones. The type 2, which was what I showed you in that um, diagram a little bit before, that uh, cryo-EM, they're more spheroidal, spheroidal or uh, cuboidal. Uh, traditionally, they were regarded, were called cuboidal, and that may become an obsolete term, but they have all kinds of function. Uh, they're very difficult to study. They take them out and they try to culture these. You can do a lot of things by culturing cells, 
but they one of their jobs is to repair damage and they will tend to differentiate into type 1 cells if there's a if there's a problem say i'm here to fix things uh the other thing is they secrete surfactant interesting aspect of this this thing has a golgi process you wonder what is this kind of cell have a golgi process well it secretes surfactant surfactant is what helps keep the airways from sticking shut or it makes it easier for um, them to open up for air to get in and uh, it's sort of like soapy as opposed it reduces surface tension almost to nothing and it's uh, lipoproteins especially um, and uh, those kinds of things are um, pr produced and uh, secreted through the Golgi process and uh, 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 the pore that you saw in that one uh, cell that I pointed out might have been uh, surfactant, a bubble of surfactant that was in an uh, envelope being emptied into the environment. Now these surfactants, there's surfactant A, B, C, and D, and C is unique to these type uh, two um, epithelial cells in the alveoli uh, in particular. But these surfactants can act as part of the innate immunity in addition to their functions. They can also kind of bind up um, uh, bad actors. There's uh, over a hundred uh, common uh, types of molecules that are not associated with human physiology that the uh, innate immunity seems to have some level of recognition for. And it can have these uh, kinds of molecules get tagged and it facil facilitates act um, uh, actions like these wandering macrophages, which are these phagocytic uh, cells that are um, in the interstitium and also in the lumen of the uh, alveoli. And they're the ones that get full of uh, soot and carbon and uh, tar when you smoke. It's, uh, somebody who smoked for years and years and have an autopsy, see the lungs look uh, pretty blackened, disgusting. Um, uh, and uh, if you see an autopsy, I've seen some unpleasant things, I guess is one way to say it, but uh, if you see an autopsy on a child, the lung tissue is uh, generally pink and clean looking. So at any rate, um, uh, I wanted to mention the innate immunity. It's an important part of this. And that's another aspect about why do some of these people uh, hardly have symptoms and uh, don't even get sick. They may have the virus and shed some, but they control it. It could be that the way their um, innate immunity is working is better and being able to that pharmacologically uh, might be another strategy for dealing with rendering this virus less lethal. Um, so anyway, back to this, back to this diagram. Ah, shoot, I'm going way, way over. I'm sorry. I, I'll try to uh, tell me to shut up when, when you need to. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, when you uh, uh, finish with talking about the disease part, what I'll do is go back and yeah, it is interesting. And uh, I find it interesting. I have a biochemistry background. And so I'll go back and tell them a little bit about what we're doing. You've talked about the virus and about the disease. And our presentation is both on the science part and on society. And if you guys don't mind sticking around a little bit, uh, we'll, we've got some really good presentation here. So go, on, go, go, for, go ahead, Dr. Hendricks. And, and I have a few slides I'll save for the last, if we get enough time to come back to about the uh, you know treatments that have been touted in the news and that sort of thing and what might work and what might not. But uh, in any case, um, uh, if you look up here in the upper left-hand corner in this nicely organized uh, infected cell, you have this long positive strand uh, RNA. And these, this is really fascinating. These just like messenger RNA produced in the nucleus, 
states. There's um, uh, processing of, of um, uh, RNA processing that goes on in the nucleus of a cell so that messenger RNA gets capped at the five prime end and it also has a three prime poly A tail or adenosine tail. Um, these messenger RNA um, like molecules from the virus also are capped. They have some untranslated uh, sequences and then a start codon. Generally messenger RNA always has a start codon AUG, AUG or methionine, which is a sulfur containing amino acid. Um, so that's, that tells the, uh, well, that's, that's the part of the uh, 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 messenger RNA that gets taken up uh, by the uh, ribosome to start with. And it goes from there and then um, has a progressive uh, reading and translation uh, going down by codons or three nuclear like a, a basis at a time uh, that matches up and hooks up amino acids. So, okay, this messenger RNA gets in there from the virus, not something you want, and then uh, it gets translated straight away by this in the cytoplasm by ribosomes. You do have three ribosomes floating around the cytoplasm. Uh, and it... Um, creates uh, this coronavirus's superpower, which is a 16 unit sub, uh, uh, 16 subunit uh, protein complex. It creates 16 non-structural proteins, NSP, um, in uh, a, a, a way of translation that's um, um, uh, uh, frame shifting, it's called. Uh, it has uh, two thirds of the genome is used for this. Uh, it starts off with the uh, 1A um, part of the genome, and then it has a loop or a knot as described in various ways, and the uh, translation shifts to the 1B uh, um, part. And so it makes, I think, about, well, but probably over 30% um, uh, of um, a 1A um, tra a transcript product, and, and uh, then the rest is a 1A, 1B hybrid. It's a, a, a peptide from two parts of the messenger RNA. I'm calling it messenger RNA. It's a message from the virus. Um, uh, that has those those have proteolytic uh, activity inherently that chop a, these up into um, uh, sixteen products, and they they form this complex. At, and this is where I'm talking. They ha this thing has superpowers. Uh, it has. Um, uh, by the way, polycystronic means that uh, it has a. Uh, you know, uh, conserved arrays of domains in uh, coding more than one uh, one product uh, in per per strand or per per length that it uh, reads. Um, so, whereas messenger RNA from the nucleus codes for one protein normally, unless it's screwy. Um, or the machine is not working right, but uh, this this is more complicated than that. So, at any rate, it produces this uh, this kind of two pro peptide products that break its break themselves up into sixteen pieces, make a complex, and it has an RNA polymerase. It's a non-structural protein 12 is a RNA polymerase. There's a helicase, which means it can um, open up uh, a, a double uh, uh, nucleic acid strand, like a double-stranded RNA, which occurs transiently in this process. It has um, a messenger RNA 
capping uh, um, activity in non-structural protein 14 and 16. And it's also got this extraordinary thing where it can proofread when it, and uh, that's in, in uh, non-structural protein 14, especially if non-structural protein 10 uh, is there with it. And it can keep the messenger RNA from getting screwed up. What happens? This messenger RNA, once it makes these this super molecule or the super complex of molecules that somewhere in there we should find a way to kill this sucker, uh, it goes and does a couple things. It reads the entire uh, uh, original genome from the five strand to the three, uh, uh, five prime to the three prime end and makes a replica in a negative sense. And from that replica, the same complex, because it has all these multifunctions, can produce two things. It, um, and well, first off, it goes from making, it, it has a reverse transcriptase. Uh, so that it, it uh, reads the negative sense RNA and makes a uh, replica of the original positive sense strand RNA. Now its error rate in this happening, and uh, Sergey, I think you talked about that, uh, Sergey, I'm sorry, uh, you talked about that uh, a little bit ago. Uh, this, this thing makes a lot of mistakes. It actually has um, potential for a high mutation rate. Um, and um, a mutation rate so high that uh, some calculate that it should not be able to have more than 15,000 bases, or it, it's twice the size it should be, or else it'll have so many mistakes, it'll just be an epic fail. Um, but it has this exoribonuclease that can detect if there's a mismatch when the uh, negative strand RNA is being uh, replicated to make the original genome again. And it can excise and replace and fix it. So this thing can self-repair its mistakes. It's really pretty amazing. That's, that's pretty much unique to these coronaviruses. And uh, then the other big thing about this from that negative strand, it produces um, all these uh, subgenomic uh, positive strand RNAs. And I won't get into it too much. It does this by its second big thing. It does it by discontinuous transcription, meaning it can get a common leader from, they, they put some uh, leading uh, sequence on and then jumps to the gene that needs to translate and from those come um, the structural proteins. Um, and um, so basically you have uh, structural proteins, non-structural proteins. Um, and uh, so 16 non-structural proteins have activity. The um, uh, structural proteins uh, are, I think of four of them right now, uh, to make the housing for the genome. Uh, well, anyway, this thing ends up as these uh, uh, proteins get uh, uh, produced uh, in the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Uh, it's felt that's where the uh, end protein is made and it's made first and it uh, is attracted to its own RNA and coats it. So the um, genome, the whole genome, gets the, that one 30K RAM, uh, uh, 30K um, uh, strand uh, gets coated with N proteins. And that's that helical nucleoprotein. And uh, then this thing ends up in the ERGIC, or this um, virus-induced uh, uh, tubulovesicular uh, structures that are between the rough endoplasmic reticulum uh, and the Golgi process. Um, 
Golgi process is sort of like a packaging center, in a sense. Well, the um, capsid uh, molecules tend to get uh, um, assembled, uh, and the envelope uh, gets assembled uh, uh, further. I guess the capsid is really the the end protein around the uh, helix. I misspoke there, but the uh, uh, in this uh, these little vesicles, uh, and they're, they're described as um, double-walled uh, uh, vesicles. They're kind of unusual, and they're associated with these infections. And inside those are where envelope ends up on these uh, things, and the um, um, uh, the uh, uh, protein. Um, viral proteins that are associated with the envelope are on there. And the spike gets added in the uh, sort of last step, and it gets extruded by budding. And then it's out uh, um, feeling single and wanting to mingle, as James Brown once said. So um, that's how this happens. And the reason I wanted to go through all that is because when I listen to the news, it's like so simplistic. And people are saying, yeah, why don't they just make the a vaccine to this or, you know, give um, uh, quinine derivatives or, you know, some uh, simplistic idea. And you got to know what you're dealing with. I mean, that's like, uh, you know, uh, walking into someone else's culture and country and, uh, Know, putting your feet up on the table and expecting, uh, <laughs> well, uh, you're not going to win out too well. So you got to understand what you're dealing with and how to beat it. And uh, you find strategies by studying what it does and seeing its weak points. And there are so many places where you might be able to interrupt vital steps in viral production or slow it down. So the, if you can just slow it down, it's like flattening the curve in an individual. Then the immune system has time to uh, clear the virus. And one other thing is uh, this uh, thing that kills people, particularly this cytokine storm. Cytokines like interferon, as these molecules that were first discovered around 1957, uh, that are uh, promoters or inhibitors of infection. And promoters of infection can get so revved up, they cause destruction uh, and destructive processes in the lungs, like filling them up with fluid. So uh, I'll stop there. And uh, I've got a little bit more. Let's see, my next slide is, yeah, I'll come back to this. <laughs> so. I, thank you for indulging me. I mean, just, I'll no, that was good, and that's why we've got you here, Dr. Hendricks, is uh, because uh, people want to know what uh, we know. Uh, it's not an unknown thing. It's very different from some of the other pandemics that we didn't know a lot about. Um, now, uh, there's a little bit of Murphy's Law. Uh, that is, uh, you're using the same script on your slide projector as I am. So uh, I'm going to go back to the first one. You're, you're at about 17 or 18, I think. So I'll be able to catch you back up here. But let me go back to number one here and bring um, mine forward for just a second. And then you'll, you can uh, um, bring them in again on what they can do and, and what uh, researchers are doing and stuff like that. OK. so. Um, one of the things we're trying to do today is to talk to you about both science and society from a science perspective, at least as far as the pandemic goes. Uh, Dr. Hendricks has uh, very, uh, in very much detail, very uh, ably told us about what this is. And uh, what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about what's happened so far and then uh, what's, what is happening. And then uh, Dr. Hendricks will talk a little bit about what researchers are doing and about um, what researchers are doing and then what we can all do uh, to help. And then 
I'll, I'll do a little bit of speculation from a science standpoint about what will happen next, and we'll open up to questions. Now, the way we work in here, as we've been doing, is that if you haven't been to Science Circle, welcome, and you can uh, feel free to comment at any time in chat. Uh, that's one of the advantages of having a world like this. Okay, so let me talk a little bit about um, what we what has happened so far. If you look at the um, slide here, it's a little busy, but uh, it, it's all happened in a very short period of time. Back in December, of course, the uh, Chinese uh, alerted uh, the World Health Organization, as, they, um, as everyone should, and then identified this as not just a, a cluster of pneumonia cases, but a new coronavirus. Um, a new coronavirus, and then the first death occurred on uh, January 11th and the first cases outside of China shortly after, um, including the U.S. on uh, Jan as early as January 20th, and then the first deaths outside of China, and then uh, one of the milestones, uh, kind of infamous milestone, was the deaths surpassed SAR-1 um, on 9 February. Now, the issue with that is if you look at SARS and MERS, which are also coronaviruses, is that they had a much higher uh, death rate. When you have uh, viruses, and Dr. Hendricks can back me up on this, but when you have uh, pathogens like this with high death rates, they usually don't transmit quite as uh, far uh, because the people who have them either die or survive. Um, but this one's kind of insidious because the flu uh, pat uh, virus um, has a much, much, much lower uh, death rate uh, than this, and then the Mars and MERS and SARS, and we talked about Ebola, of course, that's really, really uh, lethal. And so, uh, as far as the timeline goes, you can read it up there, as far as um, uh, thing, when things spiked outside of um, China, uh, Italy, and other countries decided to do a lockdown even before it was declared a pandemic. And China, as I'll show you here, uh, as, as one model, um, as early as 19 March and continuing, uh, has no, or at least reported no new local infections. But now we're up to, as far as uh, just a couple of days ago, a million cases uh, worldwide. So let's take a look at this from a perspective. In other words, um, what is what is this different than any other time we've had a pandemic? Well, pandemics, of course, have been around for thousands of years. If you look over to the left, you might have to zoom in, but the idea is those little fuzzy balls show the number of deaths in pandemic in world history, uh, the biggest being the bubonic plague or Black Death, and then smallpox, um, and then the Spanish flu, which is the uh, influenza of 1918. And than uh, other plagues, as you see. Um, I'm not making light of the number of people who've died there. It's been an enormous number of people who have died. But uh, the uh, where it says you are here down here, the tiny little dot, is comparison to uh, plagues over uh, the centuries. OK, however, uh, one of the things that's uh, very different is uh, Dr. Hendricks has demonstrated that in a century, we've learned an enormous about uh, enormous amount about these viruses and how they spread and such like that. But we really haven't changed a lot as people, okay? We've simply forgotten because there's not a lot of people that are over 100 years old. And so if you look on the right, you can read it as well as I can, but if you look on the right, that could have been written today. That was a, a Department of Health uh, bulletin by City of New York back in 1918. And um, the SARS-2, COVID-19 disease, is not influenza, but it's a pandemic, it's contagious, and basically they're telling the people 100 years ago exactly what they're telling us today. So if we look at, if we look, for example, at, yes, and, that, and that's part of the problem. In other words, uh, when you see numbers, um, when you see numbers, they're part of the problem too, so to speak. Let's take a look at this uh, slide for, for a second. Is essentially, this is what is going on right now today. 
and then I'll talk a little bit about this and then I'll hand it over to Dr. Hendricks again, is uh, it was just reported that the uh, in the United States that we've gone over 300,000. So this is actually just, I did this this morning, but you can see how fast things are progressing and you can see that by the curve down there at the bottom left. But essentially we're, we're over a million cases uh, worldwide uh, these are the uh, number of cases in different parts of the world. and But you will also notice that there are differing numbers that have recovered uh, based on when we started testing and when uh, different countries um, enacted different practices. We'll talk a little bit about that. Okay? So let me give you back to Dr. Hendricks for a second. What he will do, if you will, please talk a little bit about, unless you um, have a, some other slides on the virus itself, talk a little bit about this is what's happening. Let's take a look, little bit about uh, perhaps things that we might be able to uh, do or what researchers are doing. So I'll give you back to uh, Dr. Hendricks. Can you hear me? Yeah, let me let me get my slide one back there because I'm going oh, to have to uh, get I, you back. I want to show uh, a couple more. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to have to show you. There we go. There you go. Go oh, ahead. That was fast. Very slick. <laughs> yeah, I've been doing this for a while. Um, the uh, I, I gave a, a, a comment here about uh, Denzel Washington, John Goodman movie Fallen, which I thought was really eerie. And uh, I saw it was eerie as a physician and someone who is very scientifically oriented. Um, this um, uh, spirit, and it was doomed to exist without form, without life of its own, but it could take over people and make them do horrible things. And uh, then uh, jump to another person and that person that had been its victim suffered the consequences of whatever actions it, in, it created. And it was so much like an infection. Uh, so I, I think you might find that an interesting movie to see, just metaphorically. Um, this virus is horrible in that um, so many people are able to tolerate it and go about their business while shedding it. And um, I think it also may be more durable than we had expected. And I, I must say, uh, so many thousands of pictures of the Chinese spraying in office buildings and hallways and people sitting around but still spraying some kind of a disruptive agent in the streets uh, with huge plumes of spray. Uh, I wonder if it was alcohol mist, uh, something to disrupt this virus. Uh, uh, this, they, they, it suggests to me they knew this thing was much more deadly and dangerous than uh, um, uh, we had been uh, led to believe. There was also kind of disappointing you know it was I, I, a researcher uh, in um, Texas who wrote a, a sounded like a summary article that was put out around the 20th of January in which he talked about the Wuhan uh, China virus and he said several times this uh, is not a serious danger to Americans uh, not of serious concern to Americans unless you've been to Wuhan. And um, my response to that was, uh, I think I typed this to Baragon yesterday, is, uh, boy, Johnny, did you back the wrong horse? You know, that was a really bad judgment. One point I want to make about that is that even people that are well grounded in the science of this, uh, this sounds like uh, one of um, Socrates' uh, um, uh, arguments 
about people over judging themselves uh, and thinking because they're good at one thing, they're good at everything. Uh, also, I would cite Dirty Harry. Uh, Clint Eastwood saying a man's got to know his limitations. Uh, you got to remember what you know and what you don't really know. And anything that seems uh, um, too easy or uh, uh, there, there's going to be a lot more behind it. And people that might be behind it might be uh, doing some of this for political reasons or whatever. You got to really be suspicious and uh, question even the stuff that comes out that seems really solid and valid may get changed with long-term consensus. One of the aspects about science is that consensus can change. And we always talk about, you know, peer-reviewed and based on objective um, collection of data, and especially in control and experimental groups when possible and that sort of thing, and then reaching a consensus among informed people. But uh, uh, it's really quite a complex process. So beware of quackery. You know, there's a, I couldn't find out what the organization is. It's a, uh, some uh, uh, science uh, organization that has government funding that's giving $50 million to Vanderbilt University and to Duke University to evaluate if taking um, this um, chloroquine uh, uh, prophylactically may protect uh, healthcare workers. Uh, and they're going to do studies. They got $50 million to do studies on this. I can't help from wondering if this is somebody trying to uh, protect uh, somebody from their own foolishness uh, because it's natural to grab at straws, uh, but in real leadership, you don't, you know, just go out and sell false hope and uh, misdirect people. And there's so many people that are uh, uh, have such limited uh, ability to uh, assess what they're doing. Uh, this is a sad story, I thought, but. I kind of blame it on leaders going out there and shooting off their mouths about stuff they don't understand. The, the one place where the chloroquine might be beneficial is it um, supposedly helps inhibit the uh, action of lysosomes. And lysosomes are felt to be um, important in the uncoding of the virus. So you'll see people saying, well, since the chloroquine may um, help decrease or um, lessen the efficiency of uncoding of the virus, and so why not use it? Well, the reason not to use it, of course, these people in this story here, I didn't read it to you, but you can read it for yourself. Um, they were afraid of getting sick, and they didn't know a lot, and they just saw a word and didn't investigate it, and they're probably elderly, probably watch Fox News. Um, and which doesn't help, uh, just to be blunt. Um, yeah, is they use the wrong form. Uh, you know, uh, it's just frickin' sad. Uh, here are complications associated with chloroquine. Now, as an otolaryngologist, uh, I didn't see a lot of people who had used chloroquine uh, derivatives. Uh, some use of it has been made in uh, people with uh, um, arthritis in the past, as well as for preventing uh, uh, some of the uh, stages for malaria development. Um, present, uh, it blocks the development inside red blood cells. Uh, but a granulocytosis, that means your bone marrow stops working. Bone marrow stops working, you stop making white blood cells and red blood cells. If that's really uh, uh, extreme, um, um, you can have pernicious anemia or uh, 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 severe anemia and a granulocytosis where you have no immune system and that's kill you. Hepatotoxicity, burning the 
um, damaging the uh, liver. Uh, myopathy damaged the muscles. Neuropathy damaged uh, of neural function. Um, as an otolaryngologist, I have seen patients that had neuropathy in terms of hearing loss. Hearing loss is associated with uh, quinine. It has ototoxicity. It can affect brain function, retinopathy. Uh, so this isn't a benign drug. And I heard on the news uh, people that should have known better um, yeah, maybe I shouldn't point, uh, point, uh, I'm pointing, I'm shaking my fist. I'm doing more than pointing my finger. <laughs> uh, I heard people on the news saying, uh, uh, chloroquine, it's a safe drug. We know a lot about it. Well, it's not trivial. I, they made it sound like it's trivial. And that also misleads people into thinking, well, I can take it like a damned aspirin. Okay. Uh, the HIV cocktail. There was actually a good study uh, done. It wasn't huge, huge, but a pretty reasonable number of people, uh, uh, a couple hundred people in two groups, experimental and a um, control group, uh, that got uh, uh, part of the HIV cocktail. And uh, it didn't seem to have any benefit. And plus, uh, it caused some people more trouble. Um, so it didn't stop viral replication. Um, and they don't know if it reduced the viral replication, but it they couldn't detect a significant difference in the um, outcomes. Um, on the other hand, uh, I told you about, and the top here is again from the David Baltimore classification of viruses back in 1971 that everyone should be using. Uh, and type 4 and type 5 are both RNA viruses. And so they require RNA polymerase. And um, remdesivir, RDV, uh, has effect on inhibiting uh, uh, RNA polymerase. Um, and there's an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase in the uh, um, super protein, 16 subunit protein complex that uh, uh, arises from the initial translation of this um, um, SARS-CoV-2. So this might make sense to give it a real go. Um, and um, Putting more money into that might um, might help. Uh, it also showed some potential for activity uh, against Middle Eastern uh, Respiratory Syndrome or MERS. So MERS is related to the current pandemic. And just one way to look at this: uh, Remdesivir has uh, a structure where it's got this um, purine attached to a um, five ring um, um, sugar and uh, it's uh, analog to adenosine. Remember adenosine? If uh, whenever you drink coffee and you get your caffeine, your um, caffeine is uh, uh, acting a bit like an adenosine uh, uh, analog and keep the brain fooled that you are awake and uh, rested. Uh, so this is how these analogs work. Then they can uh, displace uh, processing of other medications. Um, I also would point out, you see uh, at, at about um, 2 o'clock on this uh, figure on the left, um, I wasn't smart enough to figure out how to move the laser, uh, so I would point it out otherwise. There's a laser associated with the sc screen that was given me, but that CN with three links to it, that is called cyanide. That's a cyano group, cyanide. And um, that's okay if it's in an organic bond like that. That's, uh, <laughs> But there's some interesting uh, components to this. Uh, but what happens is the uh, um, uh, complex 
tends to take this up and um, gets blocked and uh, gets jammed. It's uh, as they might say in popular culture, it jams the mother. And uh, so transcription uh, 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 stops because it thinks it has an adenosine uh, as it's making RNA and it's got this thing. So I think that's an interesting uh, potential. There it is with a 3D uh, model that uh, um, um, I guess it's on ProChem um, uh, that I got that. But um, at any rate, this also is used in Ebola, which is a type 5 uh, RNA virus with a, in a negative sense. But it depends on uh, RNA polymerase. Um, so that's one I think I would keep my eye on. And uh, I would stop at that, I guess. Uh, We've gone well over. I wanted to share this with you. This, uh, uh, yeah, I've got to shut up. This uh, was shared with me by my physicist friend. So, Phil, would you like to add? Hi. Yeah, let me uh, uh, bring us back to um, some of the things you're talking about, except I'm going to have to go back to, let's see, we're using the same script for a slide, so. <laughs> Hang on a second. Okay, there was a bit of chat going on um, in the audience and um, Let's take a look at this one for a second because there was a couple of things that people were mentioning. The first thing to remember is when you look at numbers, any kind of numbers like that, statistics, is um, numbers are only good as a, a, the data. <laughs> in other words, one of the things I mentioned in chat was if you look at this, it represents about 181 out of 195 uh, nations. There are a number of nations, tiny little nations in the Pacific and otherwise that it's probably likely that they did not have any cases yet because there's some of the least, uh, well, it could be, and that's exactly right, uh, Max, and there's a lot of reasons for that. Some of the little nations in the Pacific, it's, they're some of the least uh, visited places on Earth, and so it's very possible that uh, those numbers are correct. On the other hand, there's at least two nations. You can look these up. I, I don't need to be putting names in here. I told you. I told um, in chat that basically we decided not to mention names, uh, but we can uh, mention what is happening and possible reasons why. And there are at least two major countries that are not have no official cases because uh, for a lot of reasons. A, what you're looking at here is just the confirmed cases. In other words, the ones that have been tested in countries where tests have not existed in or been late coming into the ballgame in countries where the political leaders have decided that it won't it wouldn't look good to have the numbers that are correct all of that stuff uh, you will not find them on this board uh, also in countries where perhaps the infrastructure the health structure the other things um, are not designed to be able to do this and reporting and testing and uh, that sort of stuff. So you'll see, a, you'll see a number of countries on here. So this is only as good as the uh, information that we have on there right now. Well, yes, uh, and there's a lot of speculation about that. Dr. Hendricks may be able to say something about that, about the temperature. In other words, there's a lot of people there's some people that are basically saying, oh, hey, hey, this is like flu. It can go away in the summer. But I would not uh, count on that. What I can tell you is a few other things uh, that, that we do know about this. Here is one of the things we do know is that um, why are we? We need to all know why we're staying in the house or why we're being locked down. And one of the reasons we're doing that is this idea of flattening the curve. The idea of flattening the curve is purely uh, so that uh, the number of deaths per day and total number of deaths 
um, cannot overwhelm the health system. Otherwise, we really will be back in 1918 because essentially there won't be enough uh, medical staff and enough supplies in order to do uh, the testing or care for people and, pe and the doctors will be forced to make um, decisions about life and death, about you know who lives and who dies. I heard about, I was listening to that on the news and nobody wants to say, um, nobody wants to say, well, this person has so many years to live and this person doesn't or whatever and try to make those sorts of uh, uh, judgment calls. So if we all follow the guidelines, or in some countries are able to enforce the guidelines, if we all follow the guidelines, what you'll see is um, a flattening of the curve. Now what that means is two things. One is that we can keep the number of cases per day down to an amount that the health care system can uh, support that. The other thing is it gives us time to study it. It gives us time to try to find ways to combat this thing and eventually to have a vaccine, although that's not going to occur anytime soon. Uh, and therefore total deaths are reduced. Now what that also means, and I know that some people were talking about getting back to work and all that stuff like that. Um, that's a decision. Is it your life or your money? Um, this may take a while. Well, how long is a while? Well, we can take a look at that from a scientific standpoint. And here again, if I could predict the future, man, I would, uh, that would be excellent. Uh, however, comma, let's take a look at this, these graphs up here. Is, um, and you're correct, uh, with Baragon, is that a lot of countries have tried this a little differently. And you can see uh, by these graphs exactly what's happening in different countries. Um, over, let's take a look at the one over on the right. One of the things you're looking at is you're looking at some of the countries that do or did do testing and also, uh, if you want to call it collectivist countries, in other words, the countries that um, do look out for other people instead of just themselves. And you'll see there the number of cases and the days since uh, the first confirmed cases, and you'll see that their graphs are very different from graphs that are up on the left. You can also see on the far left about what it, there actually is an end to this. In other words, uh, and po po partly herd immunity, excuse me, herd immunity and other factors. Look over on the left, for example. What you see is the dark areas on the left are where there are a lot of cases reported. Uh, during that day. So for example, you'll see, of course, that it started in China, but what's happening in China? Well, China was able to, and the people are uh, a collectivist society that uh, basically look after others before they look after themselves. Um, they agreed to uh, go in isolation for nearly two months. Um, I, can, I don't know whether the US has that kind of willpower to actually be in isolation for two months. Um, and in consequence, and like Dr. Hendricks was saying, is that they took other measures and consequently look at what happened. Over a period of time, uh, they are down to where, as people are saying, in certain areas of China, they are trying to get back to some sort of normal uh, schedule. Now there is an instance, and you've seen it in the news, where there may be a slight second wave and they've uh, been tackling that. Uh, in other words, people coming back to China from other places and people being out to work, which means that we have to continue to be vigilant about this, not even talking about whether this might come back next year. You'll also see the same thing with uh, South Korea that uh, tested uh, virtually everybody, tracked virtually everybody. Everybody wore masks. Everybody was um, you know, very careful about what was going on, and it went up, and then it went uh, considerably... Uh, further down. Uh, other cases, if you look at uh, up on the top, are not so, I would say, fortunate, except we actually have a choice. Now, in Italy, which uh, was one of the very first uh, countries to uh, lock all 60 million people down uh, shortly before it was even called a pandemic, you'll actually see that the cases are starting to reduce. However, the longer you go on this, the first cases, for example, in the United States were in January. The longer you go without 
uh, taking actions. Longer people go uh, where they're still holding corona parties and uh, big church sessions and going to the beach and whatever. The longer that sort of behavior uh, continues, the bigger the curve and the more deaths and um, cases there will be and the more chance we are to overwhelm uh, the hospitals. Now, how how long might this last? Well, there are ways of taking a look at this. I can't predict the future, but for example, let's take a look at this. On the left, that is the, I, I, I mentioned what people were talking about 100 years ago, which was essentially what they're talking about today. On the left is 1918. This is not the flu of 1918, but it's a pandemic. And so things sometimes happen uh, similarly. On the left, you will see a two months. Now, where are we right now? Obviously, the curve shows that we're headed up. We're not plateauing. We're not heading down. Uh, it's As people say, it's going to get worse. Uh, but look at over on the left. It extended for about a two-month period. Look over on the right. That is China's experience with this. You also see that it was about a two-month period. In other words, if people behaved and did what they're supposed to do, and yes, of course, it's going to impact all our lives, just like 1918 impact us economically, impact us socially, impact us in, in every way possibly. Uh, but look over, the, over on the right. So you can either have and look on the left. And that's kind of uh, what has happened in the past and what's happening uh, today uh, with at least one country. So really, it boils down to what do you want? What's your value? Is it people? Is it uh, Money, is it, uh, you know, sports, you name it. Um, that's what, what it comes down to. We'll, so we'll see, you know, come back in two months and we'll give another presentation and see what actually happened. Okay? That's kind of my uh, presentation. And if I, I'll turn it back over to Dr. Uh, Hendricks, if you'd like, or we can have some questions and answers. Uh, can you hear me? I have just a couple quick comments. Um, first off, uh, epidemiologically, the most reliable way to track this right now is by deaths. Uh, deaths from coronavirus um, uh, rather than new cases. Uh, new cases uh, with it being politicized as it is, um, is uh, possibly not going to hold up and it's uh, reviewed in the future. Uh, the the statistics or the dynamics won't uh, be consistent, um, but to a larger degree, new deaths and cumulative deaths are pretty reliable parameters of where we are, and it will be for later since we haven't done adequate testing in the United States at least. Um, it's easier to identify deaths uh, than new cases, I think. Deaths from this. Um, but uh, uh, there would be some um, uh, errors in that as well, uh, you can imagine. Um, eventually, there will be serum tests for the presence of antibodies to see uh, how much of the population has immunity. Um, IG, IgG and IgM types, uh, systemic immunity. Um, uh, and um, then you might be able to um, uh, kind of back, uh, calculate uh, what the death rate of this is. But um, whatever the, the death rate is, um, the new cases would be uh, likely a um, uh, um, a uh, constant uh, multiple of that. Um, also, if you have a country like Hong Kong, uh, or, or especially uh, uh, in uh, uh, Taiwan, uh, they never uh, dismissed their um, uh, professionals and investigative agencies and the systems they had set up to deal with SARS. So when this came along, man, they were all right on it. And 
um, their numbers are quite good. Uh, uh, the um, um, there's it's so much just out there. It's like trying to see who has their feet wet when you've had a flood. Uh, at this point, uh, I, I live in a small rural town here, and we've had uh, 20 cases now. And uh, nobody comes here. <laughs> so uh, there are also comorbid comorbidities associated with the deaths. Uh, and, um, you know, th there's been plenty t spoken of that. Uh, but there were comorbidities associated with a lot of the influenza deaths in 1918 and 1919. Um, particularly, uh, there was a Haemophilus influenza uh, bacterium, a type of pneumonia. It was a secondary bacterial infection for which they really didn't have a treatment except supportive treatment. Uh, but you end up with this nasty stuff going on in the lungs and um, get debris and fluid and the innate immunity and the person's systemic immunity uh, overall gets uh, compromised. And uh, you can get uh, opportunistic infections. And Haemophilus uh, influenza bacteria was uh, not um, uh, rare. Uh, so uh, it, that was called Pfeiffer's bacillus. Um, it had been described in, uh, by a German uh, investigator back in the 1800s. And uh, for years, until 1930, when Schoff uh, demonstrated with the um, Burkfeld, uh, what it was, um, Burk something, I, I can't think of the word, uh, filter uh, that uh, filters out bacteria that they could still have a um, uh, an infectious filtrate. Um, so that something smaller than bacteria were causing uh, the uh, infection, the primary infection. But up to 1930, there were a lot of people that thought that the 1918-1919 flu was all because of Pfeiffer's uh, uh, bacillus. Because so many of them, when they had autopsies, they, they looked at it on their microscope, uh, and they saw bacillus. So the thing is, now with um, people closed in and not readily going to go to the doctor and not able to if they want to. And if they go to the ER, they're going to be sitting there for a long time. And um, I think that you're going to have potential for people having uh, comorbid uh, infections that could be treated uh, getting a run on things before they get treatment. Uh, because the system is getting overwhelmed. And you have um, places like Alabama, I think is a place that would be interesting watching. I uh, understand Alabama's got a, a shelter in place, um, stay indoors uh, order, but it starts Monday. So uh, what I see in average, ordinary day-to-day -day people who are not into science or don't like to watch the news and understand things. Uh, they're not incompetent in their day-to-day -day life, but when they have a thing like that, the government says, okay, as of Monday, you know, that means they party on the weekend right before it. So they're still spreading it. You have super spreaders and super spreading events. There was a tragic case in um, Washington of a um, coral conductor who sent out emails to over 100 people that uh, uh, he said, well, I'll be here if you want to come to practice. And they came and they had a super spreader event and something like uh, uh, almost 70 people got infected and a couple have died. So that'd be terrible to live with. But uh, once this is out there and um, the Lack of control is just one of the worst things about it. Um, I, it it's almost as, as, as ridiculous as when you have starvation 
as we've seen, anybody who's lived very long has seen areas of the world where there was horrible starvation and uh, uh, people of all ages, including newborns and children, starving to death because of war and bad leadership. And the difference is, uh, in this case, the virus doesn't care about your, uh, your affiliation within societal uh, tiers. Uh, it goes opportunistically anywhere it can, and we're all connected. So um, I, I think one, uh, one last comment, just real quickly. The United States particularly has been about the only place where you have this, okay, Baragon's got it there. Uh, these conspiracy theorists going on with nonsense and people oppositionally just disbelieving any authority or any sensible measures. And sometimes I'll be uh, South Korea, only uh, patients or, or individuals who read this or that, and then they would explain to them and they say, okay, oh, okay, I understand. They went along with it. That was what I've read. Um, I wasn't involved in those discussions, but I was impressed by the fact that they were just down to earth and, you know, not deluded by oppositional disbelief of everything. Maybe people think that being oppositionally cynical gives them empowerment when they don't really have a sense that they know anything. Uh, but that is a great weakness in our society's ability to deal with crises like this. So that's all I have to say. Okay, so one thing we can one thing that's uh, positive about all this is that we as individuals can do something, can do uh, stuff uh, to both protect ourselves, our family, and to protect others. Uh, are there any questions? Are you've got a doctor in front of you? Are there any questions about what you can do? Okay, there you go. Uh, about what masks do, what they don't, homemade masks. I mean, all of that sort of stuff. I got. Uh, that's the positive thing. We all have a we all have a decision to make about whether we can stop this dead in its tracks, and only have the cases that are now, or whether we continue to spread it and uh, continue to have uh, increased deaths and uh, a decreased economy due to that. Would you like me to address that? Yes, please. Tell us how okay. we, Just, as individuals, can uh, do our part. I think we should have all been wearing masks yesterday. Uh, anytime you step outdoors, really. Um, every time you speak, you are shedding molecules and particles and uh, um, leaving a little mist in the air. And... Um, you know, I've told people take your walks in the day, daylight because ultraviolet light will kill uh, uh, anything dependent on nucleic acids uh, within seconds uh, in good strong daylight. But uh, uh, if everyone were wearing a mask, a lot of the viral shedding would be stopped. Um, uh, and also everyone washing hands and learning not to touch their face. Um, I noticed yesterday um, a suggestion that everyone should wear masks was made by the um, current administration of the United States, but the um, POTUS said, well, I'm not going to wear one. You think for some reason you think of all these world leaders and uh, uh, dictators and uh, uh, he just couldn't see it. And so... Uh, I think the eyes too, yes. Uh, if you don't wear glasses, uh, something to cover your eyes, uh, sunglasses or something, are a good idea. If you're working with um, um, patients, you need to have goggles really, and you need an N95 mask. Um, I think uh, right now, just if you've got any kind of cloth mask, or if you can fashion one, then uh, um, uh, 
uh, it, it, it may be effective simply because it will capture the droplets and that may be splattering from your breath and your voice uh, in real time. Uh, uh, neural wonder, uh, neuro wonder, uh, so glasses and face shield, uh, uh, and that's again with working with patients where you're a um, healthcare worker at risk. But simply a, just having a, a, a population that's willing to observe um, uh, general um, guidelines for the greater good, uh, uh, whether they want to or not, uh, and uh, or whether it uh, insults their political sensitivities or not, uh, could save us. And uh, some may not have liked some of the comments I made, but you know, the problem why we're here is because nobody especially people that are afraid of losing their jobs or whatever it is, is will, are, are willing to speak truth to power. They were not willing to stand up. And it, it's the um, water slowly heating to a boil and the frogs cook. So, I don't apologize for anything I said. I was re I was restrained. So, but I do thank you for um, uh, the honor of speaking to you and uh, sharing what I know about this and uh, what I think uh, we're up against. And uh, there it is. Any more questions? Otherwise, we will uh, bring this to a conclusion. There was one question, uh, one question about hydrogen peroxide as far as cleaning non-porous surface areas. How advanced is this virus? It's got so many of the features that are typical of coronaviruses. Um, uh, it just has some um, qualities that make it very infectious. Um, and uh, yet um, uh, tolerated by people so they can spread it uh, unknowingly. And this is not the common cold. So what would you say we can, I mean, we can wear masks and such, but what would you say about uh, uh, cleanliness at home as far as viruses? In other words, there's certain surfaces which it can stay on. I've read uh, copper about four hours and cardboard perhaps a day and such. Uh, but if we do have surfaces at home, just uh, what can we use? There we go. Um, hydrogen peroxide approved by uh, EPA. Um, do you know of any other things that we could do personally? Uh, alcohol, it's recommended to be 80%. Uh, I think even if you had nothing but whiskey, which probably be about 40, 
5% alcohol, it'd be better than nothing, but uh, uh, high concentration alcohol would be useful. You need to be aware there are the, uh, in the United States, the um, FDA is going after people who are marketing stuff as disinfectants uh, and hand sanitizers when uh, they're not effective and don't even have alcohol in them. Uh, they have essential oils or something like some kind of marketing ploy. Uh, they're scams. Uh, but uh, if you've got nothing else, hot sudsy water, lots of suds, uh, like from dishwashing detergent, will um, uh, disrupt uh, the high lipid content of the um, uh, envelope of the virus. There Actually, was another the, question about vinegar, although I understand that that's probably not very acidic. Uh, I'm not sure how that would work. What do you think? Um, I would go with soap over vinegar. And um, then drying uh, any, any surfaces that you've washed, um, it may be days before you can really rely on the, uh, them being uh, free of viable viruses. Anything that produces good suds emulsifies uh, fatty stuff like viral envelopes. So I would think most any, any sudsy soap, like bar soap included, would be useful. Okay, one other important thing that people are looking at is, that particularly when we have a lot of recoveries, is that uh, is there any known information about whether recovered people are immune? I know that there are some uh, trial cases with perhaps serum from uh, people. It's not the first time we've ever done this sort of stuff. It was done back late 1800s even. Yeah. In those days, they used horse serum sometimes and they got uh, serum sickness from reactions. Uh, uh, I would not be too keen on having other people's serum uh, administered to me, but um, uh, I guess uh, in um, uh, a desperate situation, one would uh, question it. But the feeling is mostly that um, antibody infusion uh, from cooled antibodies uh, would be uh, most effective early in an infection. And early in an infection, most of the people are still being watched. They're not, uh, you know, you, you really can't tell who's going to go downhill. Okay. And uh, what about, in other words, the idea of the herd immunity? Of course, that doesn't usually happen until you have enough vaccinations. But is there, any, is there any evidence whatsoever about people who, are, who have contracted this and recovered, whether they are immune from getting it again? Yeah, actually, there were some uh, projections by um, um, people looking at uh, the mutation rate of this and the uh, antibodies to the uh, spike protein are probably going to be key in uh, your body being able to um, contain and destroy this virus before it infects you a second time. Um, the rate of um, of uh, at which the mutations occur um, are not so great. They 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 projected that a vaccine would probably have uh, several years of um, of several meaning two or three. Uh, uh, may have uh, that long of a life of uh, usefulness. But it, it may be like the flu virus where you have to upgrade the vaccines. You can have multivalent vaccines uh, for, you might end up with different strains of this uh, uh, same virus. Because uh, it does have a fair mutation rate and uh, error rate in uh, replication. Uh, yeah, that proofreading uh, um, exoribonuclease uh, is 
really a killer with this. Uh, if somehow we could inhibit that, <laughs> that would help turn the virus into duds. Anything else that the audience wants to share? Any more questions? Thank you, Max. Okay, then we'll call it a day. Everybody uh, be safe out there. Um, share what you know with others, and but don't share the virus. Thanks, everyone.